Thank you, Dia, for the kind introduction and for also bringing together this brilliant panel um, on a topic that is very much conducive towards effecting tangible changes. Uh, to briefly introduce myself, I'm a migration analyst and a writer, researcher, occasional filmmaker working on forced migration and displacement. Um, and it gives me immense pleasure to introduce each one of you because you've been working on ground realities that are highly dynamic, ever evolving and at times volatile. So I was trying to find an apt introduction to what you're doing on the ground. And I went to my usual sources, went through Google searches, the usual publications, and lo and behold, what I came across was staggering. I mean, the statistics behind the realities are something that as humans, we find it very difficult to absorb. So we tend to do what would be called social, social dissociation. We avert our eyes even when very difficult things are happening right in front of us. Um, but what is difficult to avert our thoughts from, although the statistics might be large, is individual images, individual experiences. Like, for example, the photo above, that's going to appear in a second here. That's Shahed. We have Shahed, who is now eight years old. Um, she attends school in the Beka Valley in Lebanon. She fled her home in Syria with her family. And she's a prime example of what consistent early childhood education and development can yield in terms of the long-term trajectory of children. And that's exactly what Sesame Workshop has been doing. Um, they do early childhood intervention in over, in about 150 countries across the globe. And in particular, with the Syria humanitarian response, they have a program that spans uh, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. And it's called uh, Ahlan Simsim, Welcome Sesame, uh, which Sesame being Simsim in Arabic, you learn something right. new every day. Um, and we're joined by Sherry Weston, who is the uh, uh, president of Philanthropy and Partnerships at Ses Sesame Workshop. Um, Sherry, could you tell us about why it is crucial to engage in early childhood development and to also reach these children at the right time, as early as possible into their recovery process, given that a lot of them are born amid conflict? Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, it's such an honor to be here. And, um, you know, it's, it's true that you tend to perhaps disassociate when you think a problem is overwhelming. But I think one of the things that I love about each of the people on this panel is that you can still be in these settings and see hope. And part of what Sesame does so effectively is brings, you know, proven global, I mean, excuse me, proven educational content, but with a sense of joy and a sense of hope, which these children so richly deserve. Um, your point about early childhood education is the reason we're here. Believe it or not, less than 3% of all humanitarian aid goes to education, and just a tiny sliver of that to early education. And it may seem surprising, but it, it's understandable because aid goes to shelter and immediate response and, and safety. And so over the years, as the refugee crisis has gotten to the extent where it's not a short-term crisis, these families are displaced for, you know, tens, there are, there are numbers of, um, that differ between 10 and 27 years, as, depending on the source, on the average time a family is displaced. So if we're not reaching the youngest refugees with education, how do they have a chance to go forward to rebuild their societies to reach their potential? And there's a lot of um, neuroscience today, which we all benefit from. It's, it's particularly rewarding for Sesame because we've always focused on the early years when we knew we could have the greatest impact. But when you look at the science today, you know that a child's brain develops the most in those first five years of life. We also know from the neuroscience that when a child experiences trauma, and particularly prolonged um, exposure to traumatic events, it literally debilitates their brain development. And what's the most important thing to mitigate that? It is caring, uh, more engagement with a caring adult. So that was a reason when we saw the largest number of um, refugees since World War II, half of whom are children, 
Sesame felt we have to have to step up and we know reaching them in the early years can make the biggest difference on overcoming the debilitating effects they've experienced through trauma to give them a better chance to thrive. And that's what led to our partnership with the International Rescue Committee. Um, we actually put that together because we knew Sesame, we create educational content proven around the world, um, but we're not a direct service provider. So we did a lot of research and there's so many great organizations um, working in humanitarian response, but IRC was the ideal partner for us because A, they knew the needs of refugees, we know the needs of young children. They had extensive um, experience on the ground and they cared about early education research, which is core. I mean, for Sesame, everything we do is based on research. And so we put together this partnership and I just have to say, it was before we even knew about the MacArthur Foundation's 100 and Change, um, which I'm sure most people here are familiar with. And when we heard about it, we thought, well, we should, we should go together. And I asked the IRC if they would join us um, because it was a, a very bold move on MacArthur's part to say, let's, let's look at any organization addressing a pressing need of our time. And we thought, boy, this certainly is. And you know, lo and behold, through MacArthur's audacious philanthropy, which I think has been such a great um, catalyst for others to step up, we received the 100 and Change Award, which is allowing us to create the largest early childhood intervention in the history of humanitarian space. And it, well, thank you. I know, it's huge. But it's also, it's, it's the direct services that the IRC provides. So don't, I'm sure people think of Sesame as just media. We will create the all new Ahlam Simpson, Welcome Sesame, so that we'll be able to reach children through mobile, through YouTube, through broadcast, and you'd be amazed at the penetration of media in all four countries. So that will be a great way to reach refugee children side by side with their new neighbors in Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan. It's so important that we reach the host communities as well. But then with IRC, we create educational um, content, train the IRC home visitors and community workers so they're empowered with this content so that there's actually direct interaction and direct touch to the most vulnerable children who've experienced such trauma. And I, I don't wanna um, go on too long, but we did bring a video that I think will better explain than, any, than I can possibly explain in words. But just to give you a sense, you'll see some of the work in action. You'll recognize perhaps um, some furry little Muppets. They're, you may not recognize them because they're Jordanian, um, but you'll get a sense of both the home visitation and the mass media. Sabah al khair. Our early childhood program begins in the home. Whether it's a shelter, a tent, a crowded apartment, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is that the children need to be with their parents, the first caregivers with whom they will build trusting relationships and learn new things in order for them to be able to build knowledge on the long run. Ah, okay. We give them activities to promote reading, learning the alphabet, counting, a lot of language skills. We empower the parents with skills to support their child's development. They can play with them using objects that they can find in their homes. We show them how to communicate with their children frequently in a way that promotes praise. Most of the parents that I work with, when we first meet, they describe their role as shelter provider, food provider, as the one who's making sure that their children survive. Yet with time, they start engaging with their children and they would say, I used to do this in Syria, but I was not able to do it anymore with my kids. Thank you for helping me. صارت نعقد نفسي حتى حنا لهلا تحسي على طول روح أرب من المدارس هنيك ما عاد نبعث نفتينا نبعثون على المدرسة ولهلا بس بيشوف ويسمع حس ضرب أو العاب نارية غزايف يعني أنا لهم ما في شيء ما مهوني عادي طبيعي ما عنا مو متب سوري اليوم 
موعد حفلة عيد ميلادي تنتن نحن بنعرف إنه الأطفال إجوا من بيئة مختلفة بيئة فيها حرب شافوا أشياء ممكن إنه خوفتهم يعني في عندهم حالة إنه غير الأطفال العاديين اللي هني رايحين على المدرسة فنحن لحتى نرجع لهم ثقتهم بنفسهم بدنا نحاول نحن نعمل لهم هاي كلهم نعمل لهم المكان الآمن نعمل لهم البيئة الآمنة لحتى هني بيشعروا بالثقة والمدرسة مأمنت له هالشيء فهن أكيد رح تأثر بالمستقبل رح يبنوا مجتمع أكيد رح يكون المجتمع أمني مجتمع فعال أكيد Now, what we're seeing in the video is obviously the result of multi-year interventions, which requires multi-year funding. One of the challenges that we still continue to face in education, which is only 3% of humanitarian funding and a sliver of that towards early childhood development. And one of the things that you mentioned is that you've been able to do extensive research. And one of the things you discovered is that one of the first tools that children lose amid conflict and long-term trauma is language skills. Yes. So in bringing back the language, you're not only allowing them to communicate, you're also helping them develop their imagination and their formative thinking. So this is a sort of a psychosocial aspect to education, let's say, where you look at um, conditions that will help these children succeed in the classroom and not just simply put them there and expect them to continue when they've never been in one in the first place. Well, right? it's such a good point because, you know, we do so much research. So we start by convening local experts, um, linguists, local early childhood development experts, art therapists, and bring all of these people together in the region, in each of the countries, so that we're learning from them. And it was so clear through all of our curriculum seminars that the greatest need for these children was social and emotional learning that before you can even begin to be able to um, learn the academic basics, you have to be able to express your feelings. And particularly for these children, they had no um, language for emotions. The only three emotions that could be communicated were happy, sad, mad. And if you don't give them the tools to express um, frustration, jealousy, um, all sorts of other uh, means of sharing emotions, it makes it much harder for them to um, develop the platform, the basic that they need to learn. And that is, so our curriculum focuses on social emotional at the outset, and that gives them the ability to focus, the ability to um, have more um, control of their emotions. Like, and it really is giving, laying the groundwork for them to be able to manage their own emotions, to understand others, to become more empathetic, and so it's a really powerful opportunity to be addressing these needs for young children. And to build community. Yes. Um, so now we're talking about what we saw in this video is more of a stabilized context, let's say. They're in some sort of a transition phase. What Isam Daoud does as, a, uh, as the founder of Humanity Crew and also a uh, child psychologist himself is um, that him and his team work as first responders when refugees arrive after harrowing journeys through the Mediterranean. So we're talking again about a very specific context where the psychosocial support has to be immediate, uh, yet it's in practice not really prioritized when we look at the Mediterranean crossings right now. Could you give us a little bit of an overview of your work in the region? And unfortunately, as you mentioned, the, the first aid uh, is, is um, mental health first aid is not part of the first aid. When there is any kind of crisis around the world, we send everything almost, but not mental health aid. And the thing is that we are actually responding to a crisis that happening to human beings, not to cars or machines. And if you want to save their pe these people, we need also to save their souls. I all the time say that SOS is, is mean save our souls, it's, a, it's not save our body. So um, 
<laughs> as a as a medical doctor, I'm a psychiatrist and also a psychologist, and I'm also a trained surgeon for several re- several years before. When I started working in a rescue boat in, in Greece in 2015, actually my entry ticket there, they allow me to be there because I used to be a surgeon. surgeon. It's not because I am a psychiatrist or I'm an Arabic speaker or my ex-refugee uh, background. No, it was because you are a surgeon, you can save lives. And mm-hmm. during the work and confirming death for, it was a crazy uh, period, I start notice that there's people that there is, they want to talk with me when they mm-hmm. go back down from the boat and when we meet them in, in the middle of the sea um, and they know that I speak Arabic, for example, <coughs> they start talking with me and, 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 and jokes, you know, developed and talk about everything sometimes in the boat, about Macy and football. And, 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 and then these people are just say goodbye and that's it. Um, and when I left the first time, the first mission, I come back home uh, and I start thinking what's happening with these children. They are now, they are not in Jordan, in Lebanon, for example, where they are in the same culture, the same language, even if they lose their parents. They are in Greece, in a third level hospital, in a, in a very tiny island, one, one hour flight from Athens, where no one speaks English even, and there is no Arabic speakers. Um, and then we decide in 2015, to create a team called Humanity Crew that is based on mental health professionals, mainly from the Middle East. Uh, we share the culture and the narrative also and, and, and trained uh, uh, volunteers uh, from all over the world to provide these services. Uh, I believe as a child psychiatrist that I don't, want, I don't want to treat PTSD. It's very hard. The success rate is very low. It's devastating. It's, you need to be well-trained. It's much easier for me to prevent it. Really? I just need to be there. That's all. And that's what, I, you, I, that's what we do for the last few years, that we are there to prevent this. And it's very easy. Um, working in rescue boats in, like, in a war zone, in, in, um, it can be really hard for everyone, also the volunteers, the, the aid workers, and, and, and the refugees themselves. It's, uh, but... You will, the most beautiful moments of, of my entire career as a professional, it's actually in the beach. Um, because when you see how you can transform experiences, I don't even call it traumatic experiences because I think in the, when it happens, it's an experience. What makes it traumatic is your inner resources and your ego strength and what the outside resources provide for you. If this huge amount of input and of uh, experience, just you receive it and you are, okay, what's happening here with me? It's, it's not goes with, with, with all the norms I'm regular with. It's a mistrust with all the, the, the norms and the ethics that I know and grow up with. So what's happening here? And if there's someone who will help me to process this on site, on real time, then it will go down to my, you know, emotional storage as a hard memory, but not as a traumatic one. And if not, then it will be encapsulated automatically because the cortex, that outside layer of our brain, where all, you know, it's what actually for, for, for mental health profession is the most important part of the brain, for example, because it's where what makes us a human, where we think and, 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 um, and you know, plan everything. And so um, if, if there is no one to help us to do this, then it will go down to our primitive parts of the brain and it will be stored as a, as a traumatic experience with all the senses, the sound of the sea and the smell, the, the, the faces. And then in the future, maybe it can be in one day, month, and we know that even after 30 years, any kind of reminder can reactivate this traumatic event and then let's treat PTSD. So one of the things that we do with children, um, like one of the interventions that I'm really proud of, I like actually, it also gives me a lot of joy if you're talking about, it's called the Hero Project. It's actually how we transform the children narrative. Um, we, at the beginning, we start using reframe and, you know, and, but I think it's transforming. After three years, we think it's actually, we succeed to transform 
experiences, negative experiences, to something powerful with the children because we are on site on real time and we take advantage of the plasticity and the flexibility of their brain and the level of development and then we can change the story. We don't provide the story, we help them to imagine this to become the superheroes who cross the sea and stop the wave right. with his hands and fight everyone. He's, he's, he's the one that did it. Everyone is taking picture of him. It's not because they want to report to the New York Times about the suffering. He doesn't know New York Times. He doesn't know why he was in the boat at all. Mm -hmm. If his family was mm -hmm. laughing and yeah. dancing on the boat, he would be happy. He was crying yeah. because everyone is crying. He doesn't mm -hmm. know ISIS mm -hmm. and Daesh and Bashar. He, didn't care. He, didn't, he doesn't have the capacity to understand. He's a kid. When he's in the boat, tell him that you are a hero, that you are the, the super kid mm -hmm. who just crossed the sea. He will believe it. He will adopt it. And I will show you, um, it's not, I'm not smart. It's not like I always sit at night and say, oh, it's a great idea, actually. <laughs> when we do it, I do it spontaneously. And, and I was so lucky that they did document the first kid that until now I said that he's a blessing for me. I, mm -hmm. I start all the time talking about him. Uh, someone sent me the video of um, an intervention that uh, it's when I was a surgeon, still in that, uh, in that position in 2015. And when I saw the video three months later, I say, God, I did something. Mm -hmm. He's happy. He's saying I'm a hero. He, mm -hmm. he wanted people to take pictures of him. And then the idea started developing and we started doing this. And we also won the TIT Fellowship last year. And we are trying now to involve comics in this to create superhero comics of children that serve, uh, uh, save others, and so that children can celebrate their strength actually, and also can go and help that, you know, the the superhero Omar can go and help Juan in Venezuela and make him another superhero, and then Juan will help. And it's to be like right. a, a, a a movement of superheroes. Reaction. Um, I would love to if, if we can see like a one minute video of the end uh, of sure. the intervention. Um, Thank you for sharing that and uh, just looking at those waters reminds me of the few cases that I've documented and what is remarkable and also overwhelming that it is impossible to gauge the spectrum of emotions uh, which are unique with every arrival from being shell-shocked to sheer agony and so it's such an important thing that you do where you stand there to receive them it's it's the basic feeling of there's somebody else there to talk to me and to receive me. But you're working in an extremely anti-migrant, anti-refugee political context, sadly. And we are here in Europe and the UK. I'm a bit confused these days if I should differentiate the two or not, but that's a whole another topic uh, for a different session. But here in Europe, um, there is a blanket anti-migrant, anti-refugee rhetoric, as I said, and there's also a stigmatization of the label, the definition of refugee. 
Uh, Muzun, you've been displaced. You're now Goodwill Ambassador at UNICEF, but you also have worked on the ground as an activist, and you were at some point displaced from your home in Syria and had to go through the transition, through the motions of being re resettled, finding a new home, a sense of belonging, all of which is a process that is ever evolving, right? Uh, could you tell us some of the conversations you're having with children and especially youth, and particularly male youth, given this politicized climate where they're the first to be blamed for any sort of friction or tension with host communities, but male youth also tend to be the last in terms of receiving humanitarian support or even asylum. What are the conversations you've had? And I gather you're sharing a photo slide with us that, mm -hmm. again, keeping in line with our commitment that will individualize this topic. Um, give us a glimpse of what are the discussions at the moment? Yes, of course. So, uh, as you all know that uh, I am a refugee myself and I had all those experiences before becoming an activist and before, of course, becoming a voice of millions of children. So, through my experience, which has been five years now, even more, uh, I learned so much, especially from young children uh, who has experienced a lot of uh, difficulties in their lives, basically. So let's give an example in refugee camps, for example, when I first started uh, to advocate for education because they truly believe that education is the only means that can give us hope and can help us to face the challenges in our lives. So when I uh, fled my home, I thought I cannot continue my education, I cannot continue my learning, and that uh, was uh, making me so sad because I believe uh, once I lost my education, I would lose everything in my life. And without education, I cannot achieve uh, any of my goals or even I cannot reach my dreams. So that uh, was the hardest moment, to be honest. But once I arrived to refugee camps, I found education and that moment it really changed my life because when I found education I realized that I can face all these challenges and uh, I started to advocate for other children because I, I don't only believe that education is important for me personally, it is important for everyone, for every child, every single child who uh, has the opportunity to go to school, they must go to school, they must learn because it is their right to be educated, it is their right to follow their dreams and it is not their fault to, to lose their rights, especially education. So uh, I told myself it is uh, my responsibility to tell everyone to go to school. And when I started, of course, I knew I will face so many challenges. And this, uh, this is where I started to talk to people. And of course, I had some negative feedback where people were saying it is not my business to go and uh, advise them to go to school or to be uh, educated. But, you know, all those uh, uh, negative uh, impressions really didn't make me to give up because I believe when, uh, when I started, there are so many people maybe don't believe in my message, maybe don't listen to me, but they gave me a stronger motivation because I know what I'm doing. I know uh, this message is so important. I know education can help me and help my society and also help my country because I cannot go back to Syria one day without education. Mm -hmm. If I really want to rebuild my homeland, right. I have to have a strong uh, qualifications. I have to have uh, good experiences uh, in order to rebuild Syria. It is not enough to say I love Syria. It is not enough to say I'm from Syria. Syria was a beautiful home to me before war. So it is my um, duty basically uh, uh, with uh, my fellow uh, Syrians, uh, especially children, because we know children are the future of their countries. Uh, they need that uh, strong uh, and powerful uh, education so they can rebuild Syria. And uh, I remember that uh, some of the you know hardest stories that I had uh, I had uh, a girl she was actually 17 years old and uh, she was going to uh, get married and such a young age early marriage actually was an obstacle in refugee camps 
and uh, she told me her family basically wants her to get married from a man who's like her father's age and she came to me and asked me for an advice and they told her if re- uh, if your family really wants the best for you they don't have to force you to get married at such a young age if they really want your future they must encourage you to go to school so you must be strong to tell your family about what you feel and about your dreams and your hopes i don't i, I told her of course she doesn't have to tell her family in such a bad way of course she has to just to express herself and to express her ideas and to feel that she's strong enough to uh, to fight for herself and uh, she came back to me after a few days and she told me uh, she convinced her family and she went to school and she's uh, really happy to to be educated mm-hmm. and to continue her studies so this is one of the stories that, uh, that I really felt happy to hear and of course through uh, then after my experience with UNICEF uh, through traveling to many countries including Africa uh, in particular Chad I met also other children I have met a few boys and girls a few boys who told me we cannot eat you know we really want to uh, to go to school but we don't have a school we don't have food to eat you know that's really tough to hear but at the same time i feel it is a huge responsibility because once you hear those stories it is not enough uh, to feel sad it is important i always actually emphasize that it is important to share our feelings uh, as humans uh, because we all of course <coughs> share our humanity and we all feel the same and it is important to share sadness and happiness with others but at the same time to uh, improve the lives of those people we have to take serious steps towards helping them and improving their lives and uh, what i saw in chad when i saw poor children they have really hope even if they re- live in the, such a very difficult life but they still dream and they want a good life they uh, need us as people who are lucky enough to to live a normal life uh, to have access to most of our rights we need uh, they need us as uh, individuals as well as organizations and uh, of course governments to go and help them and improve their lives and give them access to education and to provide security as well as uh, providing them with good and equality education. Thank you for that and also for expanding. Um, and also for expanding the geographic scope to Chad because what you what you talked about mostly in the Syrian context was in refugee camps mm-hmm. in Lebanon and surrounding countries where the push factors have been so strong that Syrians are leaving in small numbers at the moment uh, tens of thousands but that's projected to increase over time as the conditions in um, other host countries become more and more difficult um, but we also have a situation inside these countries of conflict Syria Afghanistan um Iraq Chad mm-hmm. as we just mentioned Sudan South Sudan where there are internally displaced communities and in these cases the children and youth are even more invisible because they lie outside of the UN conventions and protection mechanisms so in steering the conversation and expanding the geographic scope towards IDPs and maybe a little bit towards Central Asia Um, let's have a look at a short film that shows what the daily reality is like for an internally displaced child who's fled conflict with his family. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not
Друзі, хабарю, коли ми вже бачимо, як ходивши, як жаль, що вас все почав хому краще, а зараз рік його не було так. I guess my point in sharing that video is to drive home the point that any pragmatic policies will look at the source of the wound. And at the moment, European policies and EU American policies tend to apply what I call a migration tourniquet. You know, put something over the wound and constrict it more and more in the form of border closures, um, more protection, less safe passage, and sometimes even returns. But in terms of looking at the social and political realities within these countries, it's really important to build from within. Um, and as a private um, actor that's working with, of course, a humanitarian in the humanitarian sphere, how does your work, Sherry, in Syria differ from your work in surrounding countries in the sense that there's also the responsibility of um, national authorities in being able to rebuild the education system. In the Syrian context, 94% of children attended school in Syria in the pre-conflict years. So how do you do your development work and also ensure that there's, you know, sort of a local Absolutely. Well, it, well, empowerment? A couple of things I'd love to respond to is, one, when we're reaching, the reason we use the term displaced children rather than just refugee children is because to your point, if those children are displaced within Syria and haven't left the border of their own country, they're not called a refugee, they're displaced. But our program is reaching displaced children in Syria as well as those refugee children in Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon. And you know, the geopolitical challenges means our access to Syria changes. This is all through the IRC. There's not as much access in the southern part of Syria today because the government has taken back over so much. We're still in the Northeast. Um, we have to be flexible. But through mass media, it's one of the powers of using media, we can reach children who have no other means of quality um, education through television, through mobile. Syria has 96% access still to television. They only have about 50% access to internet. 
but the direct services we will still reach through the IRC, those children we have access to. Now, in order to scale, which is a critical part of this project, um, we will be starting with the IRC, but then all of these programs for community centers, for schools, um, the home visitation, we're working with the governments in Lebanon, Iraq, and Jordan so that it's incorporated into their existing programs. For us to be successful, to your point, it's not about us coming in and creating something new. We have to make that a part of the ongoing infrastructure embraced by the ministries of education, other NGOs we're partnering with in order to scale. Through media, we will easily reach 9 million children because they'll have access through, through media with quality education. And the other thing I'd love to say about the new production Aflam Simpson, is for any of you who know Sesame or maybe grew up watching Sesame, um, there are all the basics. Our mission is smarter, stronger, and kinder. And it's not just a tagline. It's the academic basics. It's stronger in terms of resiliency and help and kinder in terms of empathy, respect for differences. And so in modeling that, what I love about this production, we've created new Muppets. You'll see some that you recognize, but there will be a, um, a Muppet named Jed who's six years old and had to leave his home. He becomes best friends with Basma. And so I'm not saying it's the refugee Muppet, but I am saying that those storylines will be promoting inclusion and acceptance and understanding. Um, and then there's a little goat named Mezuzah who makes it a lot of, adds <laughs> a lot of humor. But so the, the ability to model inclusion, to have absolute curriculum infused. And, and the other important thing that I wanted to mention is you know, of that generous MacArthur audacious philanthropy of 100 million, 15 million of that is going to NYU Global Ties for Research. We'll do five randomized controls. We want to share with the world everything that works, everything that doesn't. We iterate as we go, we learn, and there is a dearth of research on what's most effective for children in crisis. We will literally double the amount of research through this grant, and we that is a huge contribution in itself. This is not intended to just be the Syrian response region. Uh, it may have been confusing. If, do you, can you put up the photo of the little girl with the hijab? Um, this, is, I, this is when I took Elmo into the Zaatri refugee camp. I mean, I, I can't tell you the joy. I mean, I've been to Zaatri many times, Azraq. But these Muppets have this universal appeal. And, and I, it, it's so powerful. The other slide that you would put up that is Bangladesh, might have been confusing before because we hadn't talked about it. But this is your point about Chad expanding. This is intended to be a model that can be adapted and used for displaced children wherever they may be. And thanks to MacArthur, the whole intent was that it would raise awareness of the importance in investing in early education for <laughs> refugee children, that it could be a catalyst, that we would create a model that could be replicated. Our goal is to transform humanitarian response. We can't leave the children behind. Your point is they have to be able to go back and rebuild their societies. How can they do that if they can't reach their own potential? So lo and behold, within a year of the MacArthur grant, the Lego Foundation decided, they had partnered with us on learning through play in Africa and Mexico, and they've been a wonderful partner, but they had never donated in the humanitarian space. And inspired by MacArthur, they went to their board and made the decision to give a hundred million dollar grant to f deepen our work in Lebanon and Jordan and expand to the Rohingya population in Bangladesh. Um, I just came back from Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh and boy, is it going to be challenging. There's so many differences. Um, the needs are the same for children who've experienced trauma. We know what they need, but the delivery will have to be somewhat different. The, unlike the Syrian refugees who were all very educated, the, the Rohingya are not. Um, the literacy rates are very low. There is no written language. Mm -hmm. um, so help, and, they, and the government will not allow us to teach Bangla because they don't want them to say, mm -hmm. stay. So, so in terms of our using media to reach them, they have no cell phones, no television. It, it will have to be adjusted in many mm -hmm. ways. The basic needs are the same and learning through play is an incredible opportunity. But I only say this because you're right, the goal is to expand these, to reach children wherever they may be and to change their trajectory. 
As you said, the context and the needs are different. So the Rohingya context, where there are over a million um, Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, and there have been hundreds of thousands for over a decade, they're an ethnic minority community that have been persecuted in Myanmar and are from Western Arakan state. That's a context that's comparable to the boy that we saw where in Afghanistan, decades of chronic conflict and displacement mean that a lot of children have been out of school. I think about half of the children between the ages of seven and 17. And for the sake of disclaimer, the video um, is something that I filmed, so I have copyright over it. It was in Jalalabad in Afghanistan and you know, the reason I shared it is because I thought if there was a humanity crew staff standing there when the when this family came and they were fresh from conflict and ISIS was only a half an hour away. If you came across this family with this boy and these sisters, what would your approach be? What is the first thing you would do to stabilize that situation? The, the most important thing when you're working with people in crisis zone is um, you need to be there for them. Um, they feel you, they feel the stress, they feel the anxiety that you can give them if you are not calm. Um, they feel um, if you are not feeling secure. So first thing, we need to be trained, mm -hmm. fully trained um, to be capable to do this and also to understand them. Um, there is a, a mix or a, like um, there's um, if I'm going, for example, to the Rohingya, I, I don't, I, I, I have to be not just culturally sensitive. Uh, culturally sensitive is just to be aware of what happened with the culture. I need also to be competent, culturally competency. So I can understand why he, who he is and why he's running from ISIS and what happened. Because the thing that I will deliver to him, as Shiri said, it's the same at the end. All the children would have the same thing, but what is the attitude, what kind of skills I need for them. It's just through understanding the culture and understand and have a huge knowledge before about the Rohingya, the camp, the, the ethnic groups, what they go through and how, because at the end, when I will help him build the narrative, it will, because if I want a narrative that will be authentic, and a narrative that he will rebuild it actually, because I don't want to deliver it to him, it need to be very rooted in his culture and in his narrative, the past one, because actually I don't bring a new narrative, I just transform what he has. Right. So I need to understand why he's running, why, he, what kind of ethnic group and what he goes through. And then when I understand the conflict, it will be easy. It will be, the, as, as a system approach, it will be, the tool is there. The, the, how we will use it is the hard part. And that's the, that's the thing as well, the scale, scalability, mm -hmm. what you're doing in your context is something that can be applied in others. And that's, I think, something the humanitarian community can do better, is learn from each other's uh, situations in very diverse contexts, but with many overlaps. And so let's bring it to the Syrian context, where many children like Khudai Nazar have never been in a classroom because they were born a bit conflict. So what would you say, how would you say their needs are different? Because maybe um, they're unable to, they, they're not so motivated to sit in a classroom starting at the age of 14 or 15. So how do you deal with education and think outside the conventional ways? Mm -hmm. In fact, this is so uh, important to question because as you mentioned, uh, when a child is born in a conflict, he or she just knows about the conflict, they know uh, about the violence, the horror, even they don't think about education as a priority or even they don't have the facilities to go to school and learn, which is something really hard. And I think now the responsibility is on the family. Uh, even if the family is experiencing something really tough uh, and they know the world, they are aware about the world, but also they had uh, a normal life before. So they know uh, education is something really important, can help their children to be uh, strong enough to uh, help themselves and also to, uh, to create a good life and even to have a peaceful life. So here the family comes to uh, encourage their children, to support them, to give 
give them hope and to uh, make them believe basically in education. And if the family is not uh, aware enough, I think the responsibility on everyone to uh, make awareness. I think raising awareness is something really important because uh, no one can go to school if they don't know anything about the school or if they don't uh, believe in education. So uh, encouraging them, advising them, and the people who are educated in society, basically they, uh, they have this responsibility uh, to step forward and go and to talk to those families, talk to those children, and to try to uh, socialize them in a sense of uh, uh, love and peace and not teaching them only about war and those difficult experiences. That depends, like if it's somebody in Syria, uh, they maybe still see violence and they still experience um, difficult circumstances uh, on the daily basis. But if they are living in refugee camps in a place where there is no war, even if there are many difficult challenges uh, here the family can uh, just teach those the children love and peace as you know both of you mentioned the things really important not only to uh, to go to those people and try to remind them in horror and violence uh, we can just you know uh, teach them about their new life give them hope and make them feel uh, life will be better uh, you have to believe in yourself and you go to school and just be educated and be believe in yourself and not only education. I, I believe that education is not only something to go to school and, you know, to have exams maybe or to be graduate or things like that. But education is something beyond that. Education can teach you about yourself and uh, teaching and uh, education can start from the early socialization, as I mentioned before, by the family or, and then by the society and the school, of course, is one of the most important uh, secondary, actually, socialization in society. But before that, we can learn about our norms, about our values, about our society, about expressing our, ourselves. So I think here when it comes really important to encourage our children. And I can give you an example, actually, about myself when I was in refugee camps. Uh, I uh, I was self-motivated to go to school and uh, to believe that education is something really important and they believe that it is important for everyone. But also I can thank my family for encouraging me and believing in my message, not only to be educated myself, but also to spread my message and to be an activist. So I think it is the responsibility of everyone uh, to try uh, to look to the positive side of our life, not only to the negative things. <laughs> No, it's a very important point um, in terms of the family role. Please, Osama, go I ahead. Just, uh, mention something as sure. a as a psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, I I agree with Brazil, but we really need to know one thing. It's the role of the parents, mm -hmm. but um, the hardcore, the core of a mental disorder or a mental situation after you are leaving your home or your house is guilt. It's a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. Like if you go to DSM-5, the Bible of the psychiatry, and you see what's the criteria for depression, for example, one of them is guilt and shame. And we, knew, we need to know that we need to reactivate the parenting code. We yes. need to ask from the parents to be active, but we need to be aware that these parents go through a lot of things yes. and their ability uh, um, is is limited uh, and also they are facing many other issues for example in the in the European context they are facing uh, a threat from a different culture they don't understand they are valued and they are uh, um, uh, observed under the values of the West so for them gender equality is the man is better than the woman why here is different if we continue judging others upon and based of our values, we will mis, uh, yeah. misunderstand them. So one of the things that we need to do is to work with the parents to not to teaching parenting, but actually to reactivate this. I believe that we need to work through the mentality of the people and not against it. Right. We need to respect it. I think it will come you know, there is time that this mentality will change and, and right. they will adapt the, 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 the new mentality. But I think it's very important to understand that these parents need us. That's, uh, that's so not, true. I mean, I have to just add to that, that, you know, in our home visitations, um, you saw a little bit in the, in the film before, but these parents have been through so much stress themselves. 
But in going in and having all of the, the home visitors are trained and they're, they're, not, they're giving the parent um, the insights, the enlightenment as to why the engagement with the child is so critical for their child to overcome this. But in the process, there's this home visitor talking to the mother, helping her with stress reduction, having someone who can listen and understand, and then giving the Sesame content is not just the tool for the child, but it's the catalyst for that engagement, which is so critical. And so the parenting part, we're doing a lot of programs around parenting. I don't mean to say like we're gonna tell you how to parent, but to give them um, not only tools, but an opportunity to be heard as well, and for them to have a greater appreciation. Even fathers, we find, when they understand that engagement and play with the child is how their brain develops, it changes the perspective of the father who used to think, well, that's not my role, but they all want their children to succeed. And even when you look at the long-term outcomes, reaching children in the early years, this is not just immediate. The, the repercussions long-term on health, on income, on um, not just education, but their outcomes on the longitudinal studies on early education, early intervention, the return on investment is tremendous. Well, most of us in this room know that there is no manual for being the perfect yeah. parent. And uh, then these communities are under extraordinary level of stress and pressure and trauma. And to just to add to that really quickly, there's also the issue of livelihood opportunities. Um, because there is a lot of child labor and displace, uh, displacement situations, whether Afghanistan or Syria, simply out of need, because the local communities have not been developed and there's just not enough jobs to go around. So education is also about, in emergency and post-conflict scenarios, is also about rebuilding that entire ecosystem and not just building classrooms and expecting them to be full of children attending every day. So on that note, I'd love to open the floor to questions. And uh, if we could ask pointed questions instead of extended comments and enable the speakers to go back and forth, that would be brilliant. Uh, I see a number of hands raised in, let's start in the very back. Okay, uh, my name is Nadia Noviwala and I used to fund uh, children's media and public art in Pakistan around conflict. Later on became a researcher to see what it actually achieved or how to judge it. So my question was that some of the things we found, and I'd be interested in what you guys have found, is that one, sustained exposure really mattered, um, rather than really event-driven exposure to either public art or um, kind of three-minute cartoon commercials on TV for children. Um, so I wonder what you guys, how you guys have achieved sustained exposure, especially if you don't have television in Bangladesh and you're doing home visits. How are you sustaining the exposure to the child so that it ends up shaping um, kind of the way, the pattern of their thinking over time rather than just one thing that many of us are exposed to at one time, maybe as a child and forget and it doesn't stay with us. Um, the second is engagement was really key because um, A, children I found played outside a lot. They didn't have the same TV watching habits that I had growing up. Um, but secondly, when you're trying to deliver a message, um, it has to be fun enough that a child demands Absolutely. repeat content and repeat watching. Um, so I wonder what you guys have found in your data, because you are Sesame Street and okay. you know are experts in this. Um, and finally, a big mistake that we made was that we did really like expensive 3D cartoons, uh, really expensive production, that when I went back and explored the non-existent children's media market, found that it could not be sustained in the local market. Um, and so while donors, me, others, were very convinced by it, we attracted a lot more funders behind us that wanted to do more of this because we had really fun content and really colorful pictures of graffiti for social media. Um, for the people, it was just a passing experience um, that children were not really interested in and could in no way be sustained locally because it was just way too expensive. Well, your point, um, listen, this is the challenge we have all over the world. When Sesame Street is 50 years old this year, when it was started in 1969, um, I think there was a huge advantage. There were only two children's shows. There was Mr. Rogers and Sesame was a huge experiment to see if television could teach and to see if it could reach less advantaged children to give them some of the same opportunities to arrive at school ready to learn. It was a, a, obviously an overnight success and there have been more research studies on the efficacy of Sesame Street than any other children's media. 
Um, the most famous was a longitudinal study that showed in the U.S. children who grew up watching Sesame Street had grade point averages 16% higher th throughout high school. Okay, that's fantastic, but in all you know, disclosure, it was much easier then because children were watching every day. Now there are over 100 different programs, cartoons, you name it, and so are you gonna get the dosage you need to have that impact? Um, we had the University of Wisconsin do a meta-analysis of our international productions, and I'm thrilled to say that the results were that there was a 12% learning gain on children who watched international adaptations of Sesame as compared to those who don't. That's the equivalent of a preschool, but it's at a fraction of cost and at scale because of the number of children we're reaching. But as even developing markets become more cluttered and there are more um, programs and choices, we have to work so hard to remain engaging. We, um, you know, Sesame Street, the, the DNA stays the same, but we're constantly creating new um, content in the in the new Arabic program, we've changed it from um, more of a magazine format to longer narratives, so children have more um, opportunity to learn from that story. We know from research we can have more of an impact. We are um, doing um, our head of Sesame Workshop India, Shanali Khan, is here today. We're investing in all new production of Gali Gali Simpson, our Indian production, to make sure we're more engaging. In terms of um, Bangladesh. We have a local production of Bangladesh called Sisimpur. If you go to Bangladesh and say Sisimpur, they start singing a song. It's as well known and beloved there as Sesame Street is in the US. So we have tremendous impact, but for the, Bang for the Rohingya, I'm gonna be able to take that programming, dub it, I'm gonna have to create community viewings or be able to provide the, the tablets, et cetera, right? So these challenges of reaching children, engaging children, having the um, ample dosage. On the home visitation, it's easy because we will see children twice a week, three hours. Like we, we will be able to um, orchestrate the amount of exposure. We have to be successful and really engaging in order to um, deliver on the, the curricular goals for the broadcast. And that's our job. We're, we're pretty good at it, but we we will constantly measure whether we're succeeding so we can iterate. Um, and the, the last point I would make just is that um, in terms of, um, you know, we worked in Pakistan too, unfortunately we had to leave, that was a hard story, did you, yeah. But the, um, the most effective thing we can do is make sure that children see themselves. It's why it's so important that we're culturally relevant, that we put so much into the storylines of the characters, the, the characters themselves being role models. And the, the number one television show in Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon is Tom and Jerry. They watch, they watch, they watch cartoons, right? That's, you know. And Sesame's more um, harder to produce. So much goes into the research, the curriculum. And live, um, live production like a Sesame Street can be less engaging than animated. We're even using part animated in the new production. So you, you're raising all the struggles we struggle with every day. So far we've been able to, to succeed, but we have to remain engaging. We have to have the reach and children have to want to watch. Can I Thank add you. a comment? Because I think Please, it's sure. for sure. Well, uh, I don't know, um, see, all the time there's um, an Arabic, Simpson, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what is it? I still think it until now. It's that, the that, opening. Was our goal, that was our first Arabic production I'm years 30, ago. I'm in, 36 in years old, and I yeah. sometimes find myself you singing this. You didn't tell me that. Part. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I'm 36. You want to know that you ah. sing it. Yeah, you can sing it for yeah. everyone. No, just when she, when she <laughs> talked about it. Like, and I still remember the song. Like, uh, And I think it's, an, it's the answer to use music. We write songs with children that celebrate their strengths, for example, because I think one of the big obstacles when you're working with children in, in, uh, and you try to transform their experiences and their trauma is to fight the, uh, of the establishing of the um, state of mind of being a refugee that they will actually uh, uh, adopt from the, their parents, from the camp, from the media, from everyone who is not aware of all that's these small actions that can really help them actually adopt 
the state of mind being a refugee, like give them the money or t taking care of everything they need and not make them do things. Right. So one of the things that we try, for example, to fight this, um, you know, establishing this state of mind of being a refugee is through creating songs with them, for example, that celebrate their strength, the comic books, right. the storytelling, um, uh, art, uh, all of these things that they, when we, when they will do any kind of activity, they actually right. will celebrate their strength and their new narrative without knowing this. Right. And I think this is a cheaper. I think it's not and to do it. And I think that it's, I'm a good example as a you know as a Palestinian who in the eighties I was in Tahrir mm -hmm. and everyone. Well, <laughs> and you mentioned destigmatization. It's one thing Sesame's really good at. Whether it's the HIV positive Muppet in in. South Africa that we created, or uh, recently we've, we've brought Julia, an autistic Muppet, to life in the United States, because you want, not only do you want children to be able to see themselves and feel less alone. So if one of the Muppets had to leave their home, you want children to identify with that story, feel less alone, but then it's always in an affirmative, positive. And, and a character like Julia, you're not only allowing children to see themselves who have autism, but it's so important to destigmatize and help other children see the commonalities and not just the differences. That, that's fabulous because all the time I say one of the things that really disturbed me much as a as a as a child psychiatrist is not uh, the refugee children. Really, between me myself when I think like about what we should do and if I have like one billion, right. it's, the, it, the it's actually community. the host community. Like, yeah. just imagine. And a kid in New York, he's like seven years old. He saw the news, he uh, heard his father talking, he saw it's like sharing posts somewhere that his president uh, separate kids from their parents and they put him in the detention center. No one told this kid or explained to him what is it. He's living in, in, in a way that there's an, an anxiety eating him from inside and he's fearing something, and, he's, and the problem when you are not aware of this, this is the dangerous, and no one is really explaining to him. And also the Greek children, why the, the children saw thousands of people walking, and ah, they, they left their home. No one is really giving the information. Oh, and well. through, for example, with the comic book that we are uh, trying, <laughs> struggling to, to do, and is actually, will be one, for example, an English version for people in U.S. to understand about the, the, the Syrian refugee crisis and the boats because they know that there is something happening like this. I want uh, when we do something for the, for example, the Mexican children in the detention center, no one can enter the detention center, but a comic book can go in, right. inside and they can read it and they can see how Juan is a superhero and Maria is a superhero. And then the English version uh, uh, you know, Mark and, and New York will read about it and will understand what's happening. And also he will celebrate the strengths of others. So it's very important, like I'd love the idea that there's an autistic, I work with a lot of autism and in the, in the show because one of the things that happened with video gaming now is that we lost this yes. kind of connection and, and things like this is, is a blessing. It's a really important point that the education has to happen also within the host communities. And there are quite a few pilot projects in the UK in public schools where there are comic books, but also um, textbooks uh, with histories of migration to demystify this because it's one of the most, the oldest phenomena that has oh, been morning. happening. Um, another question was uh, the lady in green, please. Thank you. Hello, I'm Eva and uh, I work in solar energy. Our goal is to end energy poverty. Uh, most of these conflicts are created because of energy war. And we have created a training to train teenagers uh, how to build these units. Um, and then women can become, for example, solar bakers in refugee camp. Mm -hmm. Everything is built locally inside the camp. And men, because it's usually happening like that, are more uh, likely to become builders themselves of these units. So it's a fantastic project. Um, we entered Kakuma refugee camp two years ago, and we are stuck there because of UNHCR being such a heavy administrat administrative uh, thing. <laughs> so my, my uh, question is, education is key, of course, but education like hands-on, 
to face also the climate change crisis that all these young refugees are going to face like uh, and, and, and they will ha they have to struggle with this. So for example, replacing charcoal in all refugee camps uh, by this very simple solar technology, which is very powerful, is great. And then we have this wall of administrative paperwork. And because we are working in clean tech, education, and food process, we, we don't fit all the boxes. You see what I mean? We are too at the intersection of things. And so what would it take if this inspires you something, to accelerate the adoption of, I don't know, a seed keeping or whatever, like educational hands-on skills uh, to uh, prevent uh, this generation of, of being lost and so they can be active uh, in their country when they are back or inside the camp in something like empowering. Thank you. I mean, just to quickly add to that, I think all of our children and young adults can learn about a bit more about climate consciousness and, you know, uh, better ways of using the resources. But of course, displaced communities often live off the grid, so it's a necessity for them. Um, who would like to look yes, at that intersectionality? Yeah, of course. So thank you so much for your question. I think uh, in terms of education, education is so important, not only for refugees, but in particular for refugees, because they have had a lot of uh, difficult experiences, especially they have had a trauma. So in order to cope with that trauma, they need uh, uh, good skills, uh, and uh, that good skills cannot be provided without education. So education basically can provide those children with the enough skills and uh, provide with them uh, with knowledge uh, so they can uh, uh, predict basically a brighter future for themselves and also for uh, their society. So they cannot help their society, for example, without education. So education can uh, empower them and uh, encourage them at the same time uh, to uh, dream high and to continue their life. So they cannot face those challenges if they are not educated, if they cannot read or write, for example. So once they go to school, they can learn the enough skills. And that's why quality education is something really important, not only basic education, because one of the main challenges that children face, especially refugee children, is the acknowledgement of their education. For example, uh, if they have had received good education in their countries, such as in Syria, some children, and most of them at the beginning of the war in Syria, when they fled Syria and went to host uh, countries such as Jordan, uh, or even Lebanon and Turkey, they had a qualification, so they studied uh, quality education in Syria. And so when they went to the camps or uh, maybe outside the camps, when they went to schools, they, uh, their qualifications are not recognized. So what they need, uh, what we need first to do is to recognize their qualifications and their level of education. So in order to uh, provide them with good education. So if uh, a child, for example, finished um, a nine grade in Syria, and it is a great qualification. So when uh, when they went to the camps, for example, they maybe give them a basic education, which is just to learn uh, to learn how to read and write, which is something disappointing. Those those children will feel so sad just to receive that basic education. So one of the main things when we want to teach children or when we want to provide them with good education is to think about the level of education they have received previously in order to them to give them the enough skills that they really need in order to go forward and to learn and to just to continue their normal life like others and to get their best right, which is education, which is something really important and can empower them to have access to other rights. So for example, if I am not educated, I cannot be aware about my other rights, such as my right of health or my right of anything in life, to be honest. But uh, at the beginning, if I don't have enough education, I cannot, uh, you know, have uh, enough awareness about my life. That's why I think education comes first, uh, which can help us to uh, to get uh, our other rights and to to face those challenges, basically. But touching upon your point that there are uh, young people who are qualified, perhaps that's a, 
another way of actually having them become informal community leaders so that that desire to use alternative sources of energy comes from within. And that's a, that's a more practical way of also overcoming the UN bureaucratic hurdles, just, you know, food for thought. Um, would you like to expand on any of that at an early stage? How do you inculcate this? You know, I can't knowledge. speak to, to your specific question. I mean, we do include and we have done a great deal of um, age appropriate content. You have to remember our audience age. So it's not uh, climate control, but it's love of nature. It's recycling. It's um, the things that a child is naturally inclined. Children do love nature. So we've done um, content in China about turn off the tap, about you know all sorts of things that are related to taking care of your environment and that are age appropriate. But in terms of the, it sounds like a great program and a great idea. I just have no advice on the UNHCR um, solar challenges. Please. Yeah. Uh, perfect. I have a lot of voice, so. Uh, hi, I'm, um, I'm Tarek uh, Al-Sada. I also have Syria and started Capoeira projects in uh, Syria a long time before the war came and uh, spreading over, teaching teachers and so forth. It's a bit like informal education, mix of the dance, music, play. Oh, Children great. love it. Um, but I, uh, as Sherry said, um, there is less than 3% of uh, aid basically going to education. Correct. And I want to make a statement as well, because there's actually around 1% of international aid goes to local organizations. And I think this is the elephant in the room. We actually haven't, as I would like to address this as well, because local organizations basically don't get the support. Like the system refers to the people with the NBA and with the best English, and not actually the people on the ground who are actually doing the work. So, um, so I got very, very frustrated about uh, working in that sector as a local organization and not just me, lots of other things because you know, people going, moving on to the next crisis and so on and so on. It's like a humanitarian club. And personally, I think we have a cartel structure in the aid system. Um, I um, just want to go to the question because you said like you're dealing with UNHCR and all that hurdles and so on. Just on the sideline, my wife writes a book about United Nonsense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, what I just want to say, I would like to also focus uh, when we're speaking over preventing a lost generation of youth, also looking into how actually aid is distributed. That's a very good point. I mean, in success, we will tap more and more um, partners on the ground to scale. But I, but I think it's a really good point. I, I had no idea it was less than 1%. But thank you. Disgusting, thank yeah. you for sharing. I know we've only started the conversation, but I'm afraid we'll have to formally wrap up here. But of course, the speakers are very much available. I hope you'll continue to talk to them and I'm around and available as well. Thank you thank so you. much thank for you. joining us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.